Tonight on Wings, take off with the Discovery Channel and the C-130 Hercules. When it was introduced more than 30 years ago, the C-130 revolutionized military airlift. In the Vietnam conflict, its service was invaluable. In both resupply and airlift roles, the C-130 saved the lives of thousands of troops in the field. Although replacements have been designed, none have been able to outperform this legend in military aviation. Tonight, soar high with the Lockheed C-130 on wing. The C-130 Hercules is one of the most remarkable aircraft in the world. Still in production after 35 years, the 1900th C-130 recently rolled off the line at Lockheed's plant in Marietta, Georgia. Although it looks much the same, there is nothing in the aircraft that hasn't changed. The Hercules that came off the assembly line in the 1950s have evolved into the sophisticated planes of today. From the beginning, Lockheed leaders believed in the C-130. Robert Gross, head of the corporation at the time, predicted that the Hercules would not only meet the demands of the present day, but would be capable of flying well into the future. Looking to replace its older, more cumbersome transports, the Air Force and Army were ready to enter the jet age. In fact, what the services wanted and got was a mix of truck, jeep, and airplane. Mr. Bob Roach, vice president of the Hercules program for Lockheed. They came up with a requirement for a tactical transport that had some very unique uh, demands, such as a drive-on, drive-off capability on the airplane, which required the whole aft end of an airplane to open up and numerous other unique requirements. And uh, many uh, people who saw the design, including the renowned uh, uh, Kelly Johnson, commented that it was the ugliest airplane he had ever seen. The C-130A made its first flight on April 7, 1955. Mr. Leo Sullivan was one of its pilots. Well, it's been a long time <clears throat> since the first flight, but I got to tell you that from the day we first flew the airplane, it was probably the finest transport anyone could have. Today in the C-130, we produce three aircraft a month. In days past, we've produced as high as 18 aircraft per month. And Lockheed engineers are busy designing new versions to carry production towards the 21st century. Over the years, Hercules has grown in size, range, and performance. The B model had many improvements. It was equipped with more powerful engines, four Allison T56A47s, and the three-bladed propellers were replaced by four-bladed models. Maximum range was extended to 4,000 miles. Moves were also made to shorten the takeoff distance. Lockheed developed a boundary layer control for the Hercules, adding two jet engines to the four existing prop jet engines. The jets forced air over the control surfaces, increasing lift, allowing the aircraft to take off after a ground roll of approximately 400 feet. The E model, produced for the Military Airlift Command, increased the cargo carrying ability of the aircraft to 155,000 pounds. Range was the major improvement for the C-130E. It could cross the Atlantic non-stop. On short, rough fields, Hercules often uses jet-assisted takeoff, or JATO. It cuts takeoff distance from a 1,500-foot minimum to about 800 feet. The latest model of the Hercules is the C-130H. Many improvements have brought the aircraft completely up to date. When the armed services needed an aircraft to deliver troops and supplies, the C-130 was there. Lockheed's Hercules introduced prop jet power to transports.
the Navy made an exception to the natural inter-service rivalry with the Air Force by adopting the C-130. It was initiated by the Marines who wanted an assault transport that could double as a tanker. The most dramatic feat performed by the Hercules was a carrier landing. The pilot flew his way to a distinguished flying cross by landing the plane solidly on deck. Despite success, the Navy decided that landing on carriers was too risky. Today, the Navy uses the Hercules for refueling, paradrops, and resupply missions. The U.S. Coast Guard flies regular patrols with its HC-130s. They track and mark the huge Atlantic icebergs which threaten northern shipping lanes. An increasingly important role for the HC-130 is detecting and monitoring oil slicks. Once the oil has been sighted, floating barriers can be dropped to help contain it. Because of the world demand for offshore natural resources, coastal surveillance has become more important Many nations have extended their territorial waters to 200 nautical miles. Coast surveillance teams worldwide have found the Hercules to be an ideal aircraft for maritime patrol. Currently, over 60 countries are finding uses for more than 40 commercial and military versions of the Hercules. Whatever its colors or configurations, Hercules has always been there in time of need. It has brought food to the hungry. Relief to victims of natural disasters. and hope to remote corners of the earth. It's little wonder that this flying truck is known to many as the Samaritan of the skies. The C-130 is a crew airplane, and it, it really is a crew airplane in all the best sense of the word. Uh, everybody is working together. Of course, some at different times, people have different, uh, different workloads. But uh, the uh, people flying the airplane uh, flew it as a, as a crew. And uh, many times you on the ground, you stayed as a crew, too. We call it pig and hog and, you know, other little terms that you probably heard today. <laughs> Especially when we're, you know, when we're trying to make it do something, like land, you know, talking it down. It's the same thing when you're fishing. You got to talk to the fish. You know, you won't catch it. Just like the airplane, same thing. Down there, you got to talk it down. It's, got, it's part of it. Perhaps Hercules' finest hour came in Vietnam. The aircraft's true potential was put to the test. The men who flew the C-130s were as much a part of the war as any frontline soldier. The story of the Hercules in Southeast Asia is also their story. Quite an interesting factor. One day you're doing one thing, uh, actually one one part of the day you're doing one thing, and the next day you're doing something different. Had a lot of diversions, uh, combat essential missions, hauling ammunition, emergency air vacs, taking people out mass casualties, and so on. 
Keeps you on your toes. Yeah, I had a real good diversion last time. I was flying a mission, almost through with it, and they diverted me in for emergency uh, blood resupply into a province up north. And it was uh, real interesting. I mean, we weren't expecting it. We were, thought we were through for the day. Went in there and had to bust a ceiling. It was right down at Mims and landed on a short field. It was real slippery. Excuse me, go ahead, nervous knees. Touchdown markers are 200 and 500 feet down the runway with uh, red color. Roger, copy, six years up. We're in the uh, airlift control center of the 834th Air Division in Saigon, where the daily flight operations of the airlift in Vietnam is monitored, scheduled, and controlled. The uh, boards that you see in the command center are used to display all the mission information for the some 800 to 1,000 sorties that are flown each day by C-7s, C-123s, and C-130s of the 834th Air Division. The 130 will operate in 2,500 feet, so it does have the capability to go into the forward areas, into the unimproved strips, and uh, where the activity levels are high, the C-130 has proven to be the, the real workhorse of the fleet. Came under a rocket attack while we were there, so we got a delay out of there. Took off, I think, at about quarter of eight. Went up to uh, Quang Tree. We had a combat essential load in the Quang Tree, some tank tracks for some tanks going to west to Quezon. And uh, we landed at Quang Tree at about 9.30 this morning. When we landed there, uh, we uh, had some problems with our airplane with the nose gear and some engine problems. We had to stay there for about four hours and work on the airplane. At about uh, 1 o'clock, our command post sent another airplane in to pick us up. That picked us up and uh, took us down to Chu Lai, where we had uh, some rockets to pick up to take back into Quezon. That crew flew into Quezon. Uh, we landed there at about uh, 4.30 tonight and took off again about 5 o'clock, came down to Da Nang for fuel, and uh, returned to Tonsonu. That, for us, is just about 18 hours. It's uh, 29. Uh, it's late. with the 903rd Air Medical Evacuation Squadron. We have approximately uh, 20 litters and uh, 53 ambulatory patients. They're the best pilots in the world. They'll land on a dirt strip or they'll land on a uh, piece of uh, steel stuck in the middle of some godforsaken place and do a tremendous job. Uh, I think the most difficult uh, landing I've ever been on is uh, at uh, uh, Antoy, which is on the western part of uh, an island off the western uh, part of Vietnam, Phu Quoc Island. And it has a minimum runway, uh, no lighting. And we went in there one night that was just pitch black, raining like cats and dogs. And they had smudge pods and jeeps already lighting the runway. And those fellows stuck it down there, just beautiful. Well, you hear pros and cons, you know, all from all the troops around. You hear he's saying we're doing everything over here, and the Vietnamese are not holding up their end. It's their war. They should be fighting more of it. And you get a mission like we had today, and you go up there and you pick up these troops that had their... saw some that had their legs blown up, some of them burned half to death. And I tell you, you don't get that walking around out on the street. Uh, you get kind of mixed feelings, I think. Uh, of course, you're happy to get them out of there because they're hurt. You want to get them back where they can get some treatment, some good treatment. And it's also kind of depressing. You can't get away from that. Of course, that's part of the war. People are going to get hurt. They were fighting a war. There's no doubt about it. KIA I ever hauled. I don't remember the exact uh, place that I picked it up, but uh, I knew before we landed that that's what we were picking up. I didn't know how many, 
And as it happened, we were empty. We had no other cargo on board. We came in and uh, we brought uh, an ambulance out. It was an unmarked ambulance. And uh, of course, I knew they were, you know, GI KIAs. And uh, it really makes really makes you stop and think about, you know, like uh, Alan has said before, that it may be somebody you know, or it could be you at uh, one time or another. And it's really a bad scene as far as, uh, in the, especially if you've got an empty cargo compartment. There's just you and them, and it seems awful crowded at times. This is Colonel Mike Higgins. The C-130 will be right back on wings. Well, we're back here in Quezon. I was here about three years ago, about this time. The time we were running 130s in support of the Marines.
bunker and containers. These one-ton containers, heavy bunker and barrier material, some of which you see around Quezon today. We asked the Air Force what they could do. We started with a late, a low altitude parachute extraction. They successfully delivered for a number of days just tons and tons of barrier material and supplies. every trip, but I'll say this much for them. You call them, tell them where it has to be, and they'll put it in. This is a job for airlift all the way. I tell you, man, those damn F-4 jocks, those 100 jocks, those buff jocks, they're gonna be gone. We're still gonna be over here hauling trash. Who's important? Tell me. Who's important? Hercules also carried weapons. When South Vietnam invaded Laos, the C-130 dropped 15,000-pound bombs, instantly clearing landing zones for helicopters. Return on the Discovery Channel. Now we return to Wings on the Discovery Channel. When darkness fell, AC-130 gunships armed with many guns and cannons searched out and destroyed North Vietnamese targets. Three low. There's a hit. It's on lower. Lower. Oh, wow. Let's go. Nice hit you. Oh, wait up, on huh? it. Okay, got any more? That's a boat? You betcha. Track kit on uh, tank one of target four. Hey, hey he's moving. Hit him right on. Oh, oh, oh. Continuing the gunship mission today, Hercules is still armed and ready. This C-130A is the first production Hercules delivered to the U.S. Air Force, tail number 533129. It carries more concentrated firepower than any fighter or bomber. Its mission, close air support.
This Hercules Spectre is a member of the only Reserve Special Forces Group in the Air Force, the 919th at Duke Field in Florida. Fourteen crew members fly in this aircraft. Five are gunners. They're responsible for Spectre's guns, two 7.6mm miniguns, 40mm Balfour cannons, and 20mm Vulcans. If all six guns were brought online at once, their combined rate of fire would be over 17,000 rounds of fire per minute. Spectre is a C-130 that sees in the dark. Using television, electronic sensors, and infrared systems, it locates and destroys enemy targets by night. The booth is where everything comes together. Here, the systems operators and fire control officers work along with the electronic warfare officer. His job is to detect and defeat enemy radar. He works with the illuminator operator to protect Spectre against enemy ground fire. He can launch infrared flares to decoy the guidance systems of enemy heat-seeking missiles. The kind of war the U.S. fought in Southeast Asia called for heavy reliance on close air support. Aircraft were called in to aid forces on the ground. Hercules acted as an airborne battlefield command post, or ABCCC. The C-130 directed joint air and ground operations, controlled direct air support and airborne communications during special strikes, and served as a command post for air rescue activities. The ABCCC featured a boxcar-sized package of communications and observations gear. It was loaded into the C-130 for airborne operations and could also be flown into the forward area and set up on the ground. Hercules continues to serve as a platform for the ABCCC today. The C-130 performed many other functions. The RC-130 version of the Hercules carried a huge camera lens in its belly and was equipped with cameras and special avionics in the cargo area. The RC-130 photographed the landscapes and updated the maps of many countries. Remotely piloted vehicles, RPBs or drones as they are commonly called, are launched from the DC-130 version of Hercules. Drones have been around a long time. In the Vietnam War, they were accepted as an alternative to manned aircraft. Drones flew over 3,000 missions in Southeast Asia. Of those 3,000, 200 were lost in combat. 200 that could have been manned aircraft.
Today, the drone aircraft has two missions, photo reconnaissance and electronic warfare support. On a photo reconnaissance, the DC-130 launches the drone. It descends to 500 feet and takes pictures of the target. On an electronic warfare mission, the drone flies into a high threat area and jams the enemy's radar by dispensing chaff or by using its electronic jammers. The drone is monitored by a remote control officer aboard the DC-130. When the drone returns, it is caught mid-air by the CH-3 helicopters. The crews often say that when they're trying to catch the 3,000-pound bird, they're not always sure who's got who. But this rescue helicopter has a firm hold on the situation, thanks to the HC-130. This Hercules model coordinates rescue and recovery efforts. Distress signals picked up by the HC-130 are passed on to helicopters for both land and sea rescue. The JC-130 Hercules rescued astronauts returning from outer space. It was also used to retrieve instruments returning from orbit. The aircraft was fitted with hooks and wrench lines. As the space capsule descended by parachute, the JC-130 caught it in mid-air. Other Hercules were used in creating recovery systems using airborne winches to lift loads into a plane. This led to a new way to catch a ride on the Hercules. The JC Hercules paved the way for the MC-130 Combat Talon. Special Operation Forces use the Talon with the Fulton Recovery System for live pickups. The Talon can pick up downed pilots, rescue special agents, or retrieve classified material from enemy areas. The MC-130 and its highly trained crews can fly into places where more conventional planes can't go, thanks to terrain-following radar and all-weather capability. The Fulton gear is paradropped to the man on the ground. It takes about 20 minutes to put on the special recovery suit and prepare for the pickup. The combat talent crew takes this time to complete all final checks of the Fulton system. The man on the ground releases a helium-filled balloon which carries its pickup line into position and signals the crew that he's ready. Ready, that is, for the ride of his life. seen a C-130 that uh, hit a bulldozer on takeoff and it uh, tore out uh, the ramp, the aft part of the airplane, and it flew about an hour and a half back to Cameron Bay from the forward location with the uh, ramp half hanging out the back of the airplane and uh, made it okay. I don't think they ever flew the airplane again, but at least it made it back that far. This strange-looking Hercules is Britain's C Mark II weather plane. Located behind its long candy-striped nose is a package of sophisticated weather gear. The U.S. Air Force WC-130 isn't as unique on the outside, but the mission it performs is equally as important. The WC-130 is known as the Hurricane Hunter. Where most pilots try to avoid uh, severe weather, uh, our pilots and our air crews go looking for the, the worst weather known to uh, mankind. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Dennis Wood, commander of the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, or as we're better known, the Hurricane Hunters. We are one of only two such units in the active duty Air Force and one in the Air Force Reserves. Our primary mission is to fly into the eye of hurricanes in order to gather weather data for the National Hurricane Center, which they use in the forecasting of movement, strength, and the development of tropical storms. The weather officers and drops on systems operators are part of their weather service, while the remainder of the personnel are assigned to the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron. Let's go fly storm. You fly into the weather environment to look at it, to study it, Whereas in a normal assignment, you usually stay on the ground to do that. 
A lot of times we'll go out and fly the same uh, hurricane three, four, five days in a row. Um, a lot of those times you end up flying about 12 hours. You come back and land and you have 12 hours crew rest and you're out again in the same storm the next day. In this particular mission, a navigator is really important because a computer can be used from point to point, but we don't fly point to point in a storm. We're trying to draw a line to the center of the storm and it isn't always straight. Every storm is different. Nothing can be decided ahead of time. Once you go through the wall, that's the, uh, probably the busiest time for us. Not too much thought about the hurricane goes on. If it's real bumpy, you just try and uh, work the best you can. We release the sign into the atmosphere, and it free falls with a parachute, sends back pressure, temperature, and humidity, and that we take the data, analyze it, and then send it back to the uh, hurricane center. Everything's done in a real safe manner. In over 100,000 flying hours, we've never had a major aircraft accident. The experience that I've had that I really think is worth mentioning is the first storm, because it's beautiful to look at. It just struck me that I was very fortunate to be able to see a hurricane from that direction. Not many people have. I think that we're doing a valuable service for the, the people of the United States, but the mission we do will save some lives and help people prepare. It gives us a great satisfaction to be doing that type of humanitarian mission. The sound of jet engines and the thump of the world's largest skis helped bring Antarctica closer to the rest of the world when the Hercules landed at the South Pole. It was the first aircraft of its size to do so, and it would revolutionize efforts in the Antarctic. Antarctica. The Great White Continent, stretching over five million square miles across the bottom half of the world. For centuries, freezing temperatures and long polar nights kept the South Pole locked in glacial isolation. Bridging the territory of cold and distance has been the dream of every polar explorer. In 1928, Richard E. Byrd led the first large American expedition into the Antarctic. Included in the expedition was Byrd's airplane, a Ford trimotor named the Floyd Bennett, chosen for its size, strength, and power. The expedition party struggled with the aircraft, trying to protect it against the merciless elements. From the beginning, the land seemed to resist the preparations for its aerial invasion. Finally, in November 1928, the Floyd Bennett was ready for its historic flight. Months of struggle had led up to the most significant test of the airplane in the Antarctic. Byrd planned to fly the Floyd Bennett directly over the South Pole and photograph the route as he flew.
Bird and the Floyd Bennett took off on November 29th from the base camp at Little America. Those left behind followed his progress by radio. They cheered and wished him Godspeed as he took off. Having come this far, Bird did not fail in the air. He was jubilant. Freezing temperatures and icy wind could not keep the man and his plane from their goal, the polar center 90 degrees south. Bird dropped the U.S. flag as he flew over the exact spot. It was an historic moment. His dream had been realized, and his flight was a success. It marked the beginning of the future of the airplane in Antarctica, paving the way for a more thorough exploration of the vast and forbidding continent. In the 1930s, Byrd made other trips to Antarctica, but not always with the same success. Several airplanes were battered or destroyed in the wind and cold. In later years, skis and prop jet engines would help realize the dream of polar flight and open other areas of the continent for exploration. Hercules arrived well-equipped for the job, landing on the world's largest skis, 20 feet long, weighing one ton apiece. The LC-130 can land on a remote ice shelf as gracefully as on a dry runway. From the beginning, LC-130s supported the Navy's Operation Deep Freeze, along with other scientific projects at the Pole. They revolutionized exploration of the Great White Continent, taking scientists to formerly unreachable spots. Hercules provided a lifeline of food, fuel, and supplies to these remote outposts. At the other end of the world, the L-100 stretched commercial Hercules hauled 100 million average pounds of supplies, food and equipment to Alaska's oil fields. Hercules also assisted in the transportation of construction materials for the Alaska oil pipeline. The Hercules worldwide fleet has logged almost 19 million flight hours with a history of safety and reliability. The C-130 Hercules, the workhorse of the jet age. A one-airplane air force.